I am admittedly not a golfer. I don't know the difference between a birdie and a bogey, the back nine and a back swing, or a layup and a lie. In fact, pre-pandemic, I would golf so irregularly that the last time I accompanied friends to a golf outing, the kid at the clubhouse asked if I had brand new clubs. No, I had to admit, they're about 20 years old. I just never used them. You see, about 20 years ago, I passed the bar exam in Indiana. My parents made the trek from Chicago suburbs to Indianapolis for my swearing in. And in a true example of Hoosier hospitality, it was a very nice ceremony, followed by punch and sheet cake. When we returned to our cars after consuming massive amounts of sugar, my dad told me that he had a gift for me. He went to his trunk and lifted out a set of golf clubs, telling me that now that I was going to be a big time lawyer, I probably needed to learn how to play golf. Well, little did I know that these were the exact set of clubs that my dad, a moderately avid golfer, wanted for himself. And my mom, she wouldn't let him spend the money to get them, so he figured that getting them as a gift for Pete, we could go out golfing occasionally and he could show me how to use them um, as my dad and my teacher. Well, much to his chagrin, about a year later, I would move to Arizona, get a job in the public sector where there was no need to impress clients, and my golf clubs would take refuge in a 120 degree oven that is, as you know, the average Arizona garage. So, needless to say, I don't know how to golf. And on those quadrennial golf outings that I may or may not attend, I take refuge in playing a game of best ball where I am sure to get in a foursome with someone who, like my dad, knows what he's doing. So as a result, I don't know much about the game. I don't know much terminology. I don't really know how to play. Oh, I know a few things. One, never talk during another player's swing. Two, never walk through another player's putting line. And three, be sure to repair any divots that you make. And yes, even someone like me who barely visits a golf course learns at least one term, mulligan. Now for the uninitiated, a mulligan, at least in golf, is a do-over. But not a do-over because of the rules not an instant replay type situation like in team sports or in extra life in video games. No, a mulligan is a freebie, a gift, an extra chance that you don't deserve. Someone like me doesn't earn a mulligan because I paid admission to the golf course or even because I promised to pay for lunch in exchange for getting to drive the golf cart. No, I receive a mulligan because my fellow players, my friends, choose to let me play with them even though I'm not that good, even though I never practice the sport, and even though I probably don't deserve to wear a pair of cleats. I don't earn a mulligan for anything. I do or who I am. I get one because my friends like me they want me to be there, and they want to spend the day with me, despite my lousy golf game. You don't get too many mulligans in life. You need good grades to get into college, qualifications to get certain types of jobs. Heck, in some Christian denominations, not ours thankfully, you even need to satisfy a set of prerequisites to take communion. That one always bugged me. Most days, I feel like I'm about as good of a Christian as I am a golfer. Oh sure, I start the day planning on spending time with God in the morning and evening devotions. I fully expect to spend my workday metering out justice on behalf of my clients, being a perfect father, a loving husband, oh, and have time to attend a church board meeting that evening. Plus, did I mention my nightly devotional time as well? 
I can't think of a time when I met these goals, at least not all in the same day. Morning devotional time is often spent hitting the snooze bar, followed by an argument with my son about why for some reason he doesn't want the oatmeal that he insisted upon having only five minutes ago. So much for that patient, loving father goal today. Metering out justice at work morphs quickly into a mix of managerial headaches as I try to explain to an intern why coming into work on time is actually a good thing that they don't teach you in college. And the goal of being a loving husband is often reduced to my having to calendar our anniversary on my iPhone just so I don't forget. Oh, and, and that board meeting at church? Well, the agenda for that consists of me apologizing for not starting my to-do list from the last board meeting and punting again on 99% of whatever goals I'd planned for the upcoming year. On days like these, I need a mulligan. Thankfully, God must be a golfer because he never hesitates to offer a mulligan to those of us who need it even those whose transgressions are not as mundane as the ones I just outlined. And as I'll explain, this mercy, this goodness, this grace is offered freely to each of us. And it is so transformative that once you have it, it changes your life. If the Apostle Paul wasn't bald when he began his ministry, um, he definitely became bald along the way. You can just Picture him pulling his hair out as he writes to church after church across Asia, telling the newly minted Christians to just knock it off. In his letter to the Ephesians that we read earlier today, Paul is attempting to translate the story of Christ's resurrection to the reader's everyday lives in an effort to make their transition to a new life in Christ real. As you recall, he talks of the ways they were living, placing primary importance on things valued in the secular world. They're chasing after fleeting pleasures. They're becoming angry at the drop of a hat. As one translation puts it, they, quote, were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. Children of wrath. That sounds a lot like the outrage I feel after clicking on my news feed on my iPhone most days. Having these tendencies being pulled by what television, the internet, and pop culture tells us is important leads us, as Paul puts it, to death. But by saying the word death, I'm not talking about actual death, although unfortunately for some people making a series of really bad choices can definitely lead that way. In terms of Paul's audience, whether they were Greek or Jew, living outside Palestine, the term death and rebirth were meant to establish the coming of a new age, one of justice, truth, and equality for society, and one of individual liberation for those who are held in bondage of what the world tells us is important. It was that new life to which Christians aspired, not the death of their old ways. I first came across uh, Pastor Rob Bell in an internet search uh, for progressive Christianity. Reverend Bell is not your traditional progressive. Instead, uh, he came to that title by way of an evangelical megachurch he pastored in Michigan. When I read a news article about how fundamentalist Christians often picketed uh, Bell's speeches, I started to read his work thinking that he might have something I'd like to hear. In one of his recent books, um, entitled Love Wins, a book about heaven, hell, and the fate of every person who ever lived, um, Reverend Bell notes that Jesus, like Paul, talks about death and rebirth constantly, both his and ours. Now, Jesus calls us to let go, turn away, renounce, confess, repent, and leave behind our old ways. 
He talks of that life that will come from his own death, and he promises that that life will flow to us in thousands of small ways as we die to our egos, our pride, our need to be right all the time, our self-sufficiency, our rebellion, and our stubborn insistence that we deserve to get our way. Reverend Bell writes that, like the church members that Paul was writing to at Ephesus, when we cling to our sins and our hostility, we're like a tree that won't let its leaves go. And when it won't do that, there, there can't be a spring of new life. We're stuck in the fall, and there, as Paul would put it, the fall of death. Those same Christians who protest Bell's sermons and who have trolled churches like ours, well, they see Jesus' references to life and death as a simple transactional deal. They see it as a, a ticket to heaven. It's got nothing to do with us here on earth and, in fact, is a ticket to an exclusive club, I'm assuming made out of folks who watch Kirk Cameron movies and don't like to question things. But when you read the Bible, that's not what grace is about at all. Oh, sure, I, I like to think I'm going to heaven. I, I hope so, but Limiting God's unrequited gift of grace to a ticket to the afterlife severely cheapens that gift, and it overlooks so much of the Bible that it lessens what it means to be a Christian. Receiving God's grace is like having your teacher let you take an open book exam on life. You don't have to scrounge around looking for the answers on the internet. You don't have to try to jot everything down on a 3 by 5 index card and sneak it into the test. God tells us how to live, and God tells us for free. We don't have to pay admission to this school, and God doesn't even take attendance. If we miss a few classes, if we fall behind, he'll still give us the answers, because God wants all of us to get a perfect score. And what's more, we have free access to the copy machine in the teacher's lounge, because God wants us to share his crib notes with the entire world. The salvation through God's grace isn't an exclusive club at all. It's a roadmap to forgiveness, reconciliation, and inclusion that's open to everyone, every day. Now back to grace. This free gift that we didn't ask for, don't really deserve, and can't, re can't return, um, I make no bones about it. I was a die-hard Methodist prior to coming to this church, and no one, and I mean no one, wrote more about grace and its transformative power than the founder of Methodism, John Wesley. Wesley's concept of grace is, quote, the undeserved, unmerited, and loving action of God in human existence through the ever-present Holy Spirit he writes that grace pervades all of creation and is universally present. It is not simply a gift that God packages and bestows on us. Rather, grace is God's presence to create, heal, forgive, reconcile, and transform human hearts, communities, and the entirety of creation. Wherever God is present, there is grace. Grace brought creation into existence. Grace birthed human beings bestowed on us the divine image, redeemed us in Jesus Christ, and is ever transforming the whole of creation into the realm of God's reign of compassion, justice, generosity, and peace. In other words, at least according to Wesley, and I'm pretty sure according to Paul as well, grace isn't that one-and-done ticket to salvation. It's an entry point freely available to everyone into a new life here, now, today, and forever. We don't have to worry when we fall short, when we fail to forgive, when we're mean-spirited, because our Lord in heaven knows that we're imperfect, and he gives us the true good news that we can always pick ourselves back up, brush off the sins of our past, and try again and again and again.
as the poet in the book of Lamentations, chapter 3, reminds us, God's grace is renewed every single morning. <coughs> we are alive in God's grace. And from that life, we devote ourselves to carrying out the good works of Christ Jesus. We do these things not because we expect a reward. That reward has always been there. But because we are so bursting with love for one another that we cannot help ourselves but feed the poor, shelter the homeless, preach the gospel, forgive our enemies, and love one another. Knowing that whenever we fail, God will grant us a mulligan and we simply need to take another swing. Amen.